This is the through housing joint. It's a very simple timber joint and you'll see it used in a wide range of projects. Hi, I'm Colin Klupik. In this video, I'll show you how to make one and how you might walk through that process with students. Let's have a look. The housing joint, or through housing as it is in this example, is one of the simplest and most effective methods of joining timber. Simply cut a trench through the timber, which is the same thickness as the piece being inserted, and then insert the other piece into the trench. It's surprisingly strong, even with minimal trench depth. As a guide, the trench depth is usually about a third of the thickness of the timber that the trench is being cut into. In this example of 19mm thick timber, I'm using a trench depth of 7mm, because it looks right. On the end, I've made a few cuts to get the depth right. Then I cut a test trench, and then here I've marked out the next one to be cut. For this next one, I'm going to cheat a bit and use a track saw to machine out the trench. Now, you wouldn't do this with junior students, of course, but it's an opportunity to show just how quickly and efficiently you can cut one of these with a good setup. Some people might use a router for this process instead. Look at that. Perfect. If you want to be even more perfect, you can chisel out the tiny ridges left by the saw curve to get a completely flat base. And the perfection of fit depends a bit on the type of project you're making. But what if we were to mark and cut this by hand as a student practice exercise? Once again, mark out the width of the trench using the actual piece to be inserted, rather than trying to mark out exactly 19mm, as it is in this case. Then set your marking gauge to 7mm, or whatever depth you choose. Then mark out two lines down the edge of the timber. You'll run the marking gauge between these two lines. Now, I know this process looks rather dull, and the marking gauge really doesn't look that exciting. I mean, it's not like it's the latest smartphone or something. But getting students to appreciate this important and rather manual step will help them develop better overall skills, leading to better quality projects. Then make two cuts on the waste side of the pencil lines, and one or two intermediate cuts in the middle. Then chisel out the waste. Do this carefully, chiseling from both sides to avoid tear out on the opposite sides. Remember, you can use the groove made by the marking gauge to set your chisel depth as you get close to the bottom. Be careful here. You can always take more out, but once you've cut too much away, it's gone forever. Let's check for fit. Hmm, not that great. More adjusting to do. Looks like more is needed from both sides. And this back and forth checking and chiseling is what you'll need to get that perfect fit. Mm, still not the best. Time for a second attempt. And this is something that students will need encouragement with. Too often they'll accept a bodgy result and then be disappointed with the project at the end. Let's have a look. Still a bit more work to do here. This takes some time and tenacity. You might also need to chisel on edge along the end grain to clean out the last pieces of waste material. Let's try now. Almost there. Even this last little bit here next to the pencil line is enough to stop it from fitting. Just that little bit more adjustment is needed. OK, now let's compare. This first machine cut trench is a perfect fit. Looks great. This middle hand cut one is a bit dodgy. This last hand cut one is looking much better. Yes, I'd say that's good enough. Now you can also use this method for wider pieces of timber. This is 80mm wide Moranti. You can still do this width with a chisel, but the wider it gets, the harder it is to keep the base of the trench flat. Another perfect fit. And that's the benefit of using a machined process. In fact, I like that one so much I think I'll cut that off and keep it as a demo. That's one of the reasons why making demos with your students each time can be helpful. You end up with a good selection, and it keeps things fresh. Now that's all fine for these little mini joints when you do these as practice exercises with students because the timber is quite narrow. It's only 42 millimeters wide. Uh, this one here is a little bit wider, of course, uh, but still at that width, you could probably still quite successfully do that with a chisel. After that, you probably want to use a machining type process because if a student wants to make something a bit more substantial like a, a bookcase, for example, uh, then things get a bit more tricky. Now, traditionally, you might use a router for that but setting that up can, can be tricky as well. Uh, and that's why something like the track saw can be a really good option. Let me show you how this works. First, you need to set the depth. This version of the saw has a scale that takes the thickness of the guide rail into account. That's very handy. 
This timber is 140 mm wide and 19 mm thick radiata pine, a very common choice for school projects. Using the track saw on this MFT table is very convenient because the track is aligned at a perfect 90 degrees to the fence. You can easily make repeatable cuts using this process. Setup is quick and it's a very safe process because the blade only protrudes as far as it needs to and your hands are always well clear. Dust extraction is excellent using this system. Another perfect fit. You really wouldn't try making this cut at this width using a tenon saw and chisel. I think I'll cut this one off and save it as well. Remember, multiple demos are a great thing to have in the workshop. They make great props and good conversation starters. And here it is, the humble through housing joint in three demos. We have the narrow version here, which has a machine cut joint and a hand cut joint and a couple of other attempts in between. We have a slightly larger version, which was machine cut. And we have a slightly larger version again, which was also machine cut, which you might like to use for furniture making projects or something like that. Now, once again, it is useful to have more than one demo in your workshop. And if you saw my video on the dovetail follow-up, you'll see how useful that can be to have multiple demos like these three dovetail demos on the shelf behind me. It just gives the students something concrete to measure against when they come up to you and say, oh, look, is my progress good enough? Is this one good enough? So this is something I encourage you to practice and also to practice with your students. Thanks for making it all the way to the end of this video. I hope you found that helpful and we'll see you in the next one.